Fighting Blindness Canada's Viewpoint is a virtual education series that brings you the latest in vision research presented by health experts from across Canada. The webinar you're about to watch is a recording. To learn more about the research we fund and upcoming webinars and events, please visit our website at fightingblindness.ca. This Viewpoint webinar is proudly presented by Bayer and supported by AGTC, AbbVie, Janssen, Mira GTX, Novartis, and Roche. We'd also like to thank Accessible Media Inc., our national media partner. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoy this webinar and share your thoughts with us in the comment section below. So if you are a regular Viewpoint attendee, my, uh, my partner in crime for today's session needs no introduction. <laughs> Uh, a big welcome to FBC's Director of Research and Mission Programs, Dr. Larissa Moniz. Uh, thanks for joining me today, Larissa. I'm excited uh, to chat about all the great stuff that's been happening this year. Me too. Somebody actually had just asked what um, is sort of the best part of my job. And I actually was like, you know what? It's talking about science. I love it. I love giving out money to fund science, but I also really love talking about it. So this is going to be a highlight of my week for sure. That's awesome. So why don't we dive right in and talk about science? Okay. So uh, we don't have enough time to talk about, you know, all of the great work that FBC um, has funded this year, but could you share with us maybe a few highlights from um, the last year? Um, so I would say starting basically back in January 2022, we announced um, the, the results of our research competition. And this is um, a competition we hold usually every two years where we ask scientists around the country to put in their proposals for what do they think um, are some of the most important questions that are happening in vision research. And then we um, have a really robust review process. And at the end of that, we awarded um, over $1.2 million in grants to eight different researchers. And they are researchers who are based across the country and they are also working on eye diseases um, sort of across the spectrum. So um, we have retinitis pigmentosa trying to understand ways to um, stop photoreceptor cells dying using a CRISPR technique, which is a sort of sort of relatively new innovative way to do genetic sort of um, genetic ed editing. We have um, another researcher who is looking at um, what happens once photoreceptors die in a retina in a disease like retinitis pigmentosa, another inherited retinal disease, or even age-related macular degeneration. You still have a lot of other retinal cells there. The photoreceptors are gone, but you have all of these other interneurons. And um, can they be used, can they be activated again? So um, that light can be seen, that, that you can start to um, maybe have a different form of vision. And so we have a researcher who's studying how to um, reactivate some of these, these other retinal cells using an optogenetic technique. And we also have um, researchers who are studying age-related macular degeneration, trying to identify a new treatment, develop a new research tool for glaucoma. We had a researcher studying the front of the eye diseases. Um, one of my favorites was Dr. Ajitha Thanabalasuria, who um, came on to one of our viewpoints and explained that the little crusty things in the side of your eye when you wake up are actually the, um, the eye cleaning out all the debris um, over the night. And she's um, studying ways to um, trying to understand a bit more about um, bacterial infections that have to contact lens users. So sort of a huge, like such, 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 a, such a broad spectrum of research, all doing different things, all doing really important things. So that was a, a really great way to start off our, our year this year. Yeah, it's all such exciting work. And I mean, I'll jump in and do a bit of a shameless plug for Viewpoint. I think all of the funded researchers from last year's competition or that were announced at the beginning of the year have all been on a webinar or a webinar or an in-person event this year. So if any of those projects sound really interesting to you and you missed those, I encourage you to go back and watch them. They're all available on um, our webpage. And yeah, I think we started in January and they've been kind of mm -hmm. interdispersed throughout the year. Um, so what about um, some research discoveries? What, what's going on in research this year? What, what new things have come about? So I think um, I'll start off with looking at some of the um, Fighting Blindness Canada funded researchers. I think there's been some um, really wonderful work that's happened. Some of the work we've shared about, some of it we, um, you might not have heard about. So one of the first ones um, that comes to mind, there was a, a collaboration between two of <laughs> I want to say FBC's favorite researchers because we, we don't have favorites, but they are long funded researchers. So they've been in our community for a long time and have been doing a lot of genetic research for a long time. And um, it, one of them is Dr. Kunukup and um, Dr. Michelle Cayouette. 
um, and Dr. Cayouette, a member of our scientific advisory board as well. And they are both Montreal-based researchers. Dr. Kunakoop is a clinician. He's an ophthalmologist as well as a researcher. And what he did is he found in one of his, um, one of his patients, a, a family of patients, um, presented with uh, inherited eye disease. When they did um, genetic testing, it wasn't one of the known, known genes, but they found mutations in a gene called BCOR, which was actually uh, previously known to cause cancer. But in this family, there was no history of cancer but there was a history of an inherited retinal disease. So he basically called up Dr. Cayouette, shared this um, interesting finding, and together they worked together to try to identify um, that mutations in BCOR were a new genetic cause for retinitis pigmentosa, which hadn't previously been known. And then Dr. Cayouette's lab did a, um, a lot more molecular biology research to understand exactly what was happening in the cell that was causing um, photoreceptors to get damaged and die. So that was a, a really um, interesting example of collaboration from across the sort of more basic discovery science and clinical science coming together. I love that. That's such a great story. We, we, yeah. ask, we have people ask about collaborations all the time, and that's like a superstar collaration. Exactly. <laughs> really exactly. <great. laughs> yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't ask for a better story there, actually. Um, another sort of interesting, a couple of interesting um, results came out of one of our um, big research programs called Restore Vision 2020, which you might have um, heard us talking about in the past few years. These are very large grants that we've given out to researchers around the world trying to find new treatments for advanced retinitis pigmentosa, so advanced retinal um, disease. So one of them, one of the researchers we funded was Dr. Richard Kramer at the University of Cal California, Berkeley. And um, Fighting Blindness Canada money supported development of photoswitch molecules, which photoswitches are essentially molecules that can turn other retinal cells. So photoreceptors are normally the light sensors in the eye, but if photoreceptors have been damaged or, um, or have died in advanced retinal degeneration, we still have those other cells that I was talking about that are sort of leading from the eye to the brain. And so a photo switch is trying to turn sort of those, that, that middle section of cells, turn some of those cells into light sensors. So all of a sudden you're replacing the light sensors. And so, um, so based on some of the research that was Fighting Blindness Canada funded, related photo switch molecules are now actually entering um, a phase 1B clinical trial, which is really exciting. And so it's trying to test a small molecule for advanced retinitis pigmentosa. And so this is a really interesting um, way. It's similar to optogenetics, except it's not a permanent procedure. So, so sort of what's interesting about this sort of op offers the potential to keep optimizing the small molecule, keep optimizing the drug um, as, as we go through three, these phases of trials and improve, improve the treatment. And um, one other little thing I'll share is another Restore Vision 2020 scientist, um, Dr. Gam and Dr. Beltran. Dr. Gam works at the University of Wisconsin, Dr. Beltran at the University of Pennsylvania. And they're looking at uh, to develop a stem cell therapy for advanced retinitis pigmentosa. So they published a paper this year demonstrating for the first time um, that cone photoreceptors that have come from stem cells that they actually can respond to light and they generate light signals similar to no normal cone cells in the eye. So this is sort of one of those important steps before we can start testing out the, this treatment in humans. So um, sort of a step-by-step -step process, hopefully moving towards a clinical trial. That's so exciting. We had uh, Dr. Gamma Beltran, I believe, last year at this webinar oh, so, yes. uh, come and talk about where they were. So to hear that they're making progress and that they're uh, receiving more funding to, to continue that work is really exciting. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, I know we also have our clinician scientists emerging leaders who we love to talk about. So this is a really wonderful research program that's um, pretty near and dear to, dear to us. And um, I, I know, Morgan, you, you want to, to share some, some information about that. Yeah, absolutely. I was uh, really fortunate to be able to sit down with uh, our three awardees from this year, uh, just this last week. And uh, we put together a little video uh, of some of those conversations. So it's just a short little thing and I'm gonna put it on for us, hopefully if my computer decides to cooperate um, and then we can chat about it. But uh, three really interesting uh, projects. So let's see if I can get that up. Are you seeing you're probably just seeing my screen right now. It's can you see the video, Larissa? No. 
Oh, you were oh, muted. Sorry. Could you see it? Yeah, I could see it. Could you could see it. it. Okay. So let me try to get it back up. Um, let's see here. Sorry, everyone. I'm just having technical problems today. Fighting Blindness Canada's yes. Clinician Scientist Emerging Leader Awards were launched in 2017 to build the pipeline of ophthalmologists and optometrists who also do research. Clinician scientists help translate laboratory research into the clinic and help bring clinical trials to Canadian patients. Six years on, past winners have undertaken prestigious training fellowships and launched their own independent research careers. Earlier this year, we were pleased to announce three new recipients, and today they will share information about their exciting projects. My name is Marko Popovich. Uh, I'm an ophthalmology resident physician in the Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Sciences at the University of Toronto. My name is Melanie Hébert, and I'm currently an ophthalmology resident at Université Laval in Quebec City. My name is uh, Kirill Zaslavsky. I completed my MD and PhD degrees through the Physician Scientist Program at the University of Toronto, and I'm currently a fourth year ophthalmology resident at the University of Toronto. The Clinician Scientist Emerging Leader Award will provide funding to clinician scientists who have demonstrated an interest in developing a research career to complement their clinical practice. Applications go through a peer review and the most promising projects are accepted. This year, two of the projects focus on retinal detachment and the third project investigates a condition called birdshot uveitis. The project has to do with a sight-threatening ocular condition called retinal detachment. And what retinal detachment really is, is a separation of the light-sensitive layer at the back of the eye, the retina, from its underlying support structures. Retinal detachment is repaired surgically and can either be done in the operating room in the form of a procedure called a vitrectomy, or in the clinic with a simple uh, procedure called a pneumatic retinopexy. And although vitrectomy is most often done for retinal detachments, the team here in Toronto has really pioneered the use of pneumatic retinopexy as a feasible alt alternative. We've done research that's shown that visual outcomes in selected patients can be better with pneumatic retinopexy relative to vitrectomy. And so what this project is doing is aiming to evaluate these two procedures at the population level. So for all patients in Ontario over the last 10 years who've received either of these procedures, we'll be evaluating how well they did, uh, what was the reattachment rate of the retina after the procedure in the long run, what were the surgical complications? And also, what was the cost associated with these procedures? And through this novel analysis, we'll be able to uh, provide important insights that will guide our surgical uh, decision-making in this sight-threatening ocular condition. Our funded project aims to determine what is the better surgical technique to repair retinal detachments. The retina is the screen at the back of the eye, which allows us to see. So when the retina detaches, it causes severe and irreversible vision loss if we do not reattach it. This will be a randomized controlled trial, which will study the two most commonly used procedures worldwide, vitrectomy with or without scleral buckle. Vitrectomy involves removing the vitreous, which, which is a gel that fills the eye and allows us to then use laser and gas to solidify the, the, and reattach uh, the retina. We can add a scleral buckle, which is like a belt that is placed around the eye with the hopes that it will reduce the risk of requiring a second surgery. This can, however, be associated to other possible complications. So whether or not using the scleral buckle is beneficial to most patients is exactly the research question we are trying to address here. The goal of my project is to understand the mechanism underlying birdshot chorioretinitis. Birdshot is a unique genetic autoimmune blinding disease. Every person with birdshot carries a gene called HLA-A29. That alters what the body's immune cells see, and these immune cells over time attack the tissues of the eye and cause vision loss. It can be quite difficult to control. Patients often try multiple medications. Over time, they lose vision and also suffer side effects from those medications. In over 40 years of us knowing about birdshot, all we really know is that, yes, in people's, uh, uh, their, the immune cells do respond to high proteins and it's likely some sort of T cell, but that's about all we know. So my project is aimed at using single cell RNA sequencing, relatively new technology 
that is, allows us to look at individual immune cells in a person's blood. And they can tell us what this immune cell is by looking at the, all the genes that, it, that are turned on in it, but also by reading the individual sequence of uh, the immune receptors on these cells, we can find out what they target. And so then by comparing a whole population of immune cells between people that have active birdshot with populations of immune cells, um, of people in, with treated birdshot and who, who are in remission, we hope to find cells that are then important for disease progression and disease activity. Hopefully, this can help us uh, design better treatments. The funding from this award can help the translation of fundamental and preclinical research into clinical trials, new treatments, and improved patient outcomes. It also allows young ophthalmologists and optometrists to gain crucial research experience and launch independent research careers. I sincerely thank Biting Blindness Canada for their support of our project. Uh, our project could not happen without their um, financial support in order to access the databases, to uh, involve uh, statisticians to conduct the, the complex statistical analysis that we need in order to uh, conduct this project. Um, you know, we need funding and, and what Fighting Blindness Canada has done for us has been truly remarkable and I want to sincerely thank them for all their support. The funding will allow us to jumpstart this trial, being able to recruit and follow up more than 500 patients with multiple types of ocular imaging over a year to see how they will heal after their surgery requires the time and energy of a lot of people and a strong research team. I'm very thankful for FBC for funding this project. Now, it's actually quite essential for people who are interested in bridging the worlds of medicine and research who find themselves in a long protracted period of clinical training can become, can find themselves further and further divorced from the research world. And this is the so-called valley of death where many people kind of veer off the path of research. So FBC is essential in helping me to reintegrate with the research world, but it's also allowing me to learn new methods and to keep myself current. Congratulations to this year's awardees. It isn't an exaggeration to say that this program is as essential as ever. Our candidates this year were exceptional, and this holds great promise for the future strength of clinical research. At the core of it all, vision is one of the most critical senses that allows us to interact with the world. So preventing blindness and restoring sight is really one of the most incredible and uh, rewarding uh, opportunities that we as ophthalmologists uh, get. We're at a very exciting point uh, when it comes to vision research. The way that um, ophthalmology was practiced 10 or 20 years ago is completely different than how it's being practiced today. And I'm sure it's going to be different in 10, 20 or 30 years. Um, ophthalmology is a field of innovation and being involved in that innovation to, to push our existing knowledge of, uh, of ophthalmic diagnosis and treatment uh, in order to care for our patients in a better way, I think is tremendously exciting. And I'm a truly um, humble to be involved in vision research at this time. To learn more about the research we fund, please visit us online at fightingblindness.ca. So that was, it was so great to be able to chat with them all this week. Um, uh, I really love talking with them. Their enthusiasm for research is so palpable and it's so promising to see, you know, that kind of commitment to vision research in such young scientists and clinicians. I agree. I, I really loved, I loved hearing about their research, of course, but I also loved um, hearing their enthusiasm for the research itself. And I, agree. Um, I, I felt like what Carol said about how when you're going through um, your, your residency and going through some of your clinical training, you might have um, be extremely interested in research, but there often isn't the time, there isn't the funding to support it. So right. I think it really speaks to why this program is a, quite a unique program. And um, it's a, it's a pretty close to our heart. It's a special Absolutely. program for us. Yeah, no, it's great. So you've shared a little bit about um, sort of the FBC funded research, some research developments uh, over the past year. So looking sort of beyond the work uh, that we've been fortunate enough to fund, what other, you know, you go to conferences and you're really involved in the space. So what other trends, developments have you seen or been keeping a close eye on over the past uh, year? So I, I would say there is, 
the way research work, there's like sort of small steps in every direction. So we're seeing um, stem cell therapies, um, prosthesis, optogenetics. We're um, starting to see some results of um, very sort of late stage research. We're really moving into clinical trials for prosthesis and optogenetics, some very early stage clinical trials. And we're seeing new treatments for glaucoma, for A and D, new treatments for geographic atrophy. Um, I would say so in terms of some of sort of the big things that happened this year, one would be, of course, in Canada, um, Luxorna has been delivered to Canadian patients for the first time, and the first province has approved funding of Luxorna. I still have, um, what's it called, nine provinces to go and the, and the three territories, of course, but um, it's, it's getting there. So that, that's really exciting news. I think, um, to me, what encapsulates sort of this um, constant, forward, exciting movement is I got a report from one of our patient registry sites um, detailing, um, this is for inherited retinal disease, the Fighting Blindness Canada Inherited Retinal Disease Patient Registry, and sort of detailing all, all the work they've done this year. And for the like first time, they, they noted that 13 patients this year were entered into clinical trials in Canada alone for the patient registry, which I thought was amazing. And that is just one of one site in Canada. Um, with those numbers. I think it really just shows the number of clinical trials that are starting to come to Canada. And of course we want more, but um, that's really exciting. So sort of speaking about clinical trials, one of the, I think, big themes this year was around how do we make clinical trials even better? So we've had sort of that first phase of clinical trials, Luxterna being at sort of the forefront of it, being really successful. However, this year we did see a few clinical trials that looked very promising at phase one and phase two, and then in phase three, um, they were they were still promising, but they weren't hitting what is called their endpoint. So when you're setting up a clinical trial, the research team has to state beforehand exactly what they're going to measure to show success. So, for example, does um, this treatment increase visual acuity? by a very specific amount. It can't just increase it, it has to increase it by a specific amount. Or does a treatment um, improve how quickly a person can move through a maze? And this was actually one of the readouts for, for Luxterna. And so most trials measure many different endpoints, but there's usually one or two primary endpoints. And if the trial at the end of it, if it hasn't met that sort of benchmark, that preset benchmark, um, the trial is considered to not have succeeded. And it's very, very hard to then move it forward to get approved by either the FDA or the European regulatory agencies, or in Canada, it would be Health Canada. And so in 2021, 2021, 2022, we did see a few trials that had looked really promising, but then they didn't quite meet what was pretty high benchmarks to meet. And so I think a lot of researchers are not now um, asking, how can we make sure that the endpoints are are going to be successful. So we're spending so much money with this clinical trial. How do we really get closer to it being successful? Because they, a lot of them can see from their patients that functional vision is improving, but perhaps visual acuity isn't. So is visual acuity the best metric? And some of this is actually just I'm working with regulatory agencies. Sometimes the clinicians would love to have a, an endpoint that they think is more meaningful, but a lot of the regulatory agencies, they have very specific things that they will accept. So I think there's gonna be um, work in the coming years with the FDA, with the EMA, which is the European Medical Association Agency, to try to understand what are the best and most creative endpoints. And some of this comes down to doing natural history studies, actually, uh, making sure that we understand how each individual disease progresses. Maybe clinical trials have to be a little bit longer. It's very expensive, but that might be a another way with some eye diseases, which are very slow progressing, it's sometimes hard to see change if you aren't looking for a long enough period of time. So I think really trying to figure out a way to make sure that these um, investments in innovative treatments and trying to get them through clinical trials are sort of being as efficient as possible. It's interesting. Is, do you think it's fair to say that this is because these treatments are so new and so innovative that the measures that we might have used before may not really be reflected in, in these, these types of treatments? And that's interesting about working with regulatory bodies to sort of shift the way that we understand, you know, how, how vision works. I think that's a really good point, Morgan, actually. I think that's exactly it in terms of the how new these treatments are until Luxterna. That was the first treatment for an inherited retinal disease. And so regulatory agencies are used to looking at eye diseases such as glaucoma, age-related macular degeneration, 
maybe diabetic macular edema, maybe a corneal disease, but those are very different. They have a very different population they're impacting. They've got a very different disease progression. And so it's a little bit of a catch up, which it, it feels unfortunate, but that's uh, sort of how it works. Like the regulatory agencies, they're trying to do their best to make sure that patients are safe and that treatments that they approve are effective. So like, it's a very important role to have it there, but there is a little bit of catch up we had. I know in other spaces, um, that's also been an issue, for instance, in, uh, in the cancer space where I, I, I've done some work in the past, um, there was a lot of work trying to understand how do you get sort of those most meaningful endpoints that actually show that a treatment is working. So it's, it's happening in every disease space. And I think now it's the time for, uh, for eye diseases and maybe in particular some of these for inherited retinal disease or retinal degeneration. Absolutely. Um... So earlier this year, when we had our town hall, I believe, uh, you teased a little bit about a new uh, research competition, new research grant competition that was happening, started this year and moving into next year. Um, can you give us a bit of an update? Tell us what's uh, what's happening with that? Absolutely. I'm, I'm sort of apologizing if I'm starting to get a bit fuzzy. There's a lot of light coming in from the side. So I'm going to try to just shift over a tiny bit. Let's see. Yeah, that's quite there. a quite a yeah. aura about you. There's a glow. There's a glow <laughs> happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, I think the competition work that you're talking about is called the Transformative Research Award. And this is actually this has been a really exciting competition for Fighting Blindness Canada. It's a, a new program of work. It has been, I would say, um, inspired by some of the, the work that we talked about. So, so about from Restore Vision 2020, we've had um, some wonderful support from some major donors, which have allowed us to fund Restore Vision 2020 and some other large projects. And we wanted to take the next step. And that's where the Transformative Research Awards came in. So this is a competition that is trying to award grants up to $1.25 million each. So very large awards over five years. And for this specific competition, we're looking for projects that will either help reduce or prevent vision loss or restore vision for individuals with retinal degenerative diseases. And that includes inherited retinal diseases like retinitis pigmentosa or Stargardt's disease or Usher syndrome. It includes age-related macular degeneration and glaucoma. So we are at our sort of phase two of the competition. So in phase one, we asked, um, researchers international or Canadian to put in proposals. We got some um, really high quality proposals from researchers in the States, in Europe, in Australia, obviously in Canada. These proposals, these short proposals were reviewed and um, proposals that were considered to be sort of the most meritorious, the most exciting, the most um, likely to have a big impact were invited to submit a larger full application. So that's the stage we're at now. So. The applications are going to be reviewed again by an uh, international panel of, of reviewers, and we will be um, excited to share the, the decision next year. So I can tease a little bit more so that the decision, the, the, the announcement will come sometime in 2023. Well, we look forward to that for sure. And uh, you can bet as soon as those announcements are made, I'll be trying to hook them into viewpoint. So we will be able to have them all come and share about their projects next year as well. Um, so looking forward into 2023, um, what, what can we, what can we look forward to in terms of research? Are there, are there studies or things that are about to happen that, that you're really excited about? Yeah, I think so, sort of the exciting thing about research is you often don't know what is coming. So I'm sure I'm going to say, well, these are the things that I'm most excited about. And next year when we have this conversation, it will be probably a whole, whole range of things that I, I didn't even see. So I would say off the top of my head, some of the areas that I think are going to be um, both exciting, but also potentially game changers. Um, the first one would be a new treatment for geographic atrophy. So currently there are no treatments for geographic atrophy. This is um, advanced dry AMD. So when AMD develops, most people, they start off developing dry AMD. Dry AMD in some cases can progress to wet AMD where you can get anti-VEGF injections, which stop some of the sort of blood vessel growth or bleeding in the eye. Um, dry AMD can also progress to a very advanced form, which is called geographic atrophy. And at that point, it causes vision loss, 
causing severe vision loss without having to get any treatments. We don't really understand why the progression happens, and once it progresses, there is nothing we can do. However, there have been there are a number of um, potential treatments for geographic atrophy in clinical trials, and one of those, um, PEG Seto plan, I think I'm pronouncing it right, it's a, a slightly long name, um, that will be, um, that has been um, submitted to the um, FDA, which is the American regulatory body. And um, I think if that is successful, then um, in t probably 2023, hopefully 2023, they will submit it to Health Canada. So I think in the near future, we will start to see both that one as well as potentially some other treatments for geographic atrophy come on the market. Um, some other things in the age-related macular degeneration space are biosimilars. There are going to be some biosimilars, which are um, in a really simple way. This isn't exactly right, but in a simple way, you can consider them generic version of anti-VEGF treatments. So the first ones for anti-VEGF are coming into the Canadian market. What does this mean for patients? I think um, one is really important for patients to understand if their doctor is um, suggesting switching a medication, why are they doing this, what would be the implications, biosimilars should have the same effect as their original treatment, um, but you, you do want to understand about, about that. Um, it does have some potential cost savings for the Canadian healthcare system, which you know that we're talking, I think, all the time about sort of the healthcare crisis that's happening right now. Um, so cost savings are good, but we also want to make sure that if a treatment is working, that patients aren't sacrificing their eye health. So we'll be keeping an eye out on biosimilars for sure. Um, I think something else that I'm really excited to hear about is a trial for an oral medication called NAC. So the full name is N-acetylcysteine. Um, and this is, um, to me, it's really unique because it's an oral medication as opposed to it being um, drops or injections in the eye. And this is currently being treat tested for patients with retinitis pigmentosa, could potentially be expanded to other types of inherited retinal diseases. Um, NAC is not gene specific. So as opposed to a gene therapy, which is targeting a very specific gene mutation, this is sort of for any type of gene mutation. And it's the premise behind it is that it helps protect cells against damage caused by oxidative stress. So NAC is something called an antioxidant. And what researchers have found is that oxidative stress can increase in the eye when cells like photoreceptors are dying. So this obviously happens as the disease progresses in inherited retinal diseases like retinitis pigmentosa. Photoreceptor cells get damaged, they die, and that releases a lot of um, sort of oxidative stress. And so what the researchers for this trial are testing is if NAC, which is an antioxidant, can reduce the oxidative stress and reduce um, sort of other cells, because once you've got um, this oxidative stress thing, you've got the photoreceptors dying already, and the oxidative stress sort of adds even more stress on it and kills cells even faster. So it isn't necessarily going to stop vision loss progression, but it might slow it down, which is extremely important. And um, NAC, as I mentioned, is an antioxidant. It's naturally found in onions. It's also already been FDA approved for other conditions. Um, and so it is overall a safe drug, which is wonderful. And so we know that there is sort of a sort of base level of safety profile. Now we're gonna test it to see, does it reduce vision loss progression? And the lead researcher is Dr. Peter Campuchero. He's at John Hopkins. Um, he's also actually a Fighting Blindness Canada funded researcher. He's tested um, this drug in a phase one and phase two trial, and now it's moving to a phase three trial. And very excitingly, there will be a site in Montreal and Dr. Rob Kuhn, who is the lead on, on this trial in Canada. And so we're hoping that this launches in 2023. We don't have any more um, details yet about that, but as soon as um, the trial is open, I'm sure um, Dr. Kuhn will be, be happy to share, share more information about that. I, uh, I've already had some questions about this this trial through health information. Um, people have asked, like, can they just eat like a lot of onions or <laughs> or purchase like? Because I believe there is a, a form of the supplement that is available commercially, um, but we're sort of cautioning people away yes. from that, right? Like, we want people to actually go through the process of the trial because there's some dosing issues. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the point of the trial is like we don't actually know if it's effective yet. So if we we think it might be effective, but we don't know for sure. That's the point of the trial. But I think um, even more importantly is that supplements that you buy in stores, you have to be very careful because you don't know what other things might be included. They won't be a pure form of, of NAC. Um, and 
We also don't know if it is going to um, have negative impacts on vision or vision loss or other have other side effects. That is exactly why the clinical trial is happening. Um, at taking in, in other treatments, it has often been used for like a very short term thing. From, you give it once or twice and that's it. It hasn't been taken long term. So we don't know if there could be potential negative side effects. Oh yeah, that's um, interesting. Not only in your vision, but also for other sort of aspects of your health. So it is pretty important to, um, so you sort of wait for the, the trial to be done before starting to, to consider taking it. Yeah, I mean, it's something we've talked about multiple times before around supplements and vitamins is that, you know, it's the, even though we think they're vitamins, they're still drugs that you're putting in your body. So we need to be aware of how they could interact with other things you're on and um, all that. So thank you for that caution, because I do, I get that question a lot. I, I didn't know anything about that it was in onions. And then I got a question like, can I just eat more onions? And I was like, why would you eat more onions? But it makes sense now. <laughs> I mean, so I would say, like, I, I, this is just probably general health advice. They always say, like, eat a balanced diet. Like, onions, I'm sure, are part of a balanced diet. As somebody from um, sort of an Indian culture, we do love onions, and we believe that onions are really good for your health. But um, yeah, it's sort of a, a balanced diet is, is always good, but whether it can actually reduce vision loss, I, that I think you might need to eat probably a lot of onions. A lot of onions. So yeah. there might be other, other, <laughs> other, other side effects from that. For sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Morgan, I was wondering, so I, I know, um, most of the people on the call sort of know wonderful Morgan from these viewpoint, um, these viewpoint mm -hmm. programs, but I, I, you've got a really busy other, other parts of your job where you're sort of helping us to share information and communicate and, and work with our community. So I'm wondering if you could tell us, like, what are the things that you've really enjoyed in 2022? What have um, it's given, given you joy? Oh my gosh, so many things. It's been a really uh, exciting year, I think, for us, especially after the last couple of years that have been definitely challenging in terms of, um, you know, kind of revamping our educational programs to be online. And this year, we were really excited to actually be able to go back in person. So we've had, this is our seventh webinar this year, but we also had two in-person events, uh, one in Vancouver and one in Toronto. And they were wonderful, uh, just really great opportunities to connect with the community, to see people that we haven't seen in a long time, meet new friends, um, you know, connect with other community groups and resources. Um, and of course, uh, be able to connect our, uh, our friends, our doctors, our physicians, our researchers with uh, the community, which we can't do as much online in the same way that we can do in person. So that was really wonderful. Um, you know, we also had our Great Young Leaders program, which was super uh, in person. We've expanded our mentorship program even further uh, to include more individuals. Uh, we've got new resources on our website. Hopefully you're following along in e-news and have seen all those this year, but there was a great page on optogenetics. So if uh, some of those things Larissa was talking about today kind of felt a little like you want more information, we've got a great page on that. Um, bionic eye and of course we just refreshed our AMD page as well so there's a lot of information about dry AMD and geographic atrophy that's been added uh, to that as well and of course uh, Godfrey and I continue to monitor our health information line so um, I know a lot of our viewpoint uh, regulars have reached out through that that service as well so uh, please I encourage everyone to reach out to me there at healthinfo at fightingblindness.ca if you have further questions. Um, in terms of other projects, we had actually worked on a, a really great project this year around um, carers and people who supporting care for people who are living with vision loss. And so we had a great working group of carers that joined together to really talk about the joys and some of the challenges that that role um, has and it was developed into a survey that some of you may have filled out earlier this year and we're just in the final stages of putting that data together so hopefully we can share some results of that with our community next year. Um, another thing I just wanted to mention about this past year we had our second uh, Eye on the Cure uh, which if you don't know is sort of like a Dragon's Den style research competition it's so fun um, we had three finalist teams uh, that battled it out for $100,000 in research funding. 
Um, and if you've watched Viewpoint before, there were some familiar faces there, Dr. Bob Chow, who's presented at Viewpoint before, uh, Dr. Anna Ells and Dr. Alan Zhu, I think have all been on here before. Uh, they were on two of those teams. Um, and it's really great. You can watch it for free. It's available uh, at fbcionthecure.ca. And I'll put that link in the uh, follow-up email today too. It's a, a really entertaining hour and three just really good projects. I'm glad I wasn't on that academy because I don't know how anyone <laughs> could choose. They were all really exciting. So uh, 2023 is coming up and I just wanted to give everyone a little sneak peek too of what we're going to be doing next year. So we have heard your feedback loud and clear. We will We'll be continuing with our webinars. Uh, even though we're going to be doing some in-person stuff, we'll be continuing on and uh, we'll be having a little break over the holidays and back probably in February with our next Viewpoint webinar. Uh, and then we're going to be going out to Alberta and Toronto for in-person events. Uh, we're going to be expanding our mentorship program even more. So if that is intriguing, our applications are open for that now. Uh, and I really encourage anyone out there who is interested to reach out and we can give you more information uh and excitingly we're starting a podcast in the new year so that'll be really fun too and we'll be able to share more information about that uh early in the new year where we're going to talk to researchers physicians people with lived experience tell some stories it's going to be good I'm, I'm tired it, actually now. yeah i was gonna say that was a, that was a nice whirlwind of stuff i'm, I'm really excited to um to see the podcast it's sort of going to be a nice companion piece, I think, to, to our Viewpoint series. I think so, too. I'm really looking forward to it and getting to, to dig down into people's stories a bit more, which I think is going to be really great. So I am going, we're going to just pause for a second. I know I see some questions have come in, and if you have any questions, this is a great time. You can type them in here or send me an email, um, but I'm going to bring on our colleague, Jamie, hopefully just for a minute to join us, maybe. I'm just having Zoom, Zoom troubles today. See if I can try that again. And now's a great time to put in your, oh, it seems like I've, oh, there she is. I think it's just taking Got some it. time. Good, okay. <laughs> Jamie, are you with us? <laughs> I'm with you, hi. Hey. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you guys doing? We're good. Well, I can't, I've I been can't. listening to you, so I know how you've been doing. <laughs> busy. <laughs> busy, yeah. We can't see you. Can you see Jamie? Larissa? Not yet. I can, no, I think, no. I think you're putting on oh. your camera now. I can see oh, there you. There you are. Hi. <laughs> we made it. Can you see me? Oh, we yep. can see you now, yep. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, Morgan. Thank you, Larissa. Hello, everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, hello, my name is Jamie Alexanderson. I'm the Senior Manager of Development at Fighting Blindness Canada. And uh, I was just chatting with Morgan before um, the webinar started. I understand there's over 130 people registered for this webinar today. That is fantastic. Thank you all for joining us. And I can't believe this is the last webinar of 2022. It's incredible. And congratulations to the team, seven webinars this year. That's amazing. We are so grateful. And, and I just, you know, I want to take a minute to say, you know, this wouldn't be possible with all of you, without all of you. Um, thank you to everyone who has supported and contributed to Fighting Blindness Canada. You are making investments that will last a lifetime. It's with donors' generous donations that Fighting Blindness Canada is able to invest in groundbreaking vision research and education. And it's a wonderful time of year to consider making a gift. So if you'd like to consider making a gift and donating to Fighting Blindness Canada's year-end fundraising campaign, any amount is meaningful and every gift makes a difference. And this year, thanks to a special anonymous donor that is offered to match all donations up to $40,000 until December 31st. So really, there is no better time than now to make a donation and to double your impact. So to make a special year-end gift to Fighting Blindness Canada, please visit our website at fightingblindness.ca or call us at 1-800-461-3331. And again, thank you. We're so grateful to all of you and we wish you all a very happy and healthy holiday season. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. And then thank you to our, that, that anonymous donor. That's a really exciting uh, 
exciting absolutely at the end of the year it's great and i think morgan you're going to send out a survey at the end of the webinar that has all of fighting blindness canada's contact information so if you didn't get a chance to make a note of our phone number or website you can check back on the survey that morgan's going to send out to everyone and i'm sure there'll be a link there um, for um, an opportunity to make a gift and a donation so thank for you sure. thanks jamie <laughs> All right, so let's get, I see there's lots of questions. So let's um, let's dive in. Um, so we have our first question, Larissa, is from Shaban, and she, he or she is asking, how can a person with RP uh, get into the clinical trials that you mentioned? So it, I think it would depend on which clinical trial we're talking about. So if it is a clinical trial that is gene specific, so it's for somebody who has got, um, say it's a gene therapy, um, I saw a question below about um, XLRP. So if it's a gene therapy trial, first of all, you would have to make sure that you met the eligibility criteria. So there, you had the mutation that they were targeting, but also there's a lot of other eligibility criteria in a clinical trial. So if you meet those um, eligi eligibility criteria, which you would often have to do a lot of tests to understand if you did, um, it sort of depends in some cases, if the trial is happening in Canada, then it's a little bit easier for Canadian patients to get involved. I think the first thing to do would be to talk to your ophthalmologist. If you've got an IRD specialist, even better. Um, you can also reach out to the health information line who can um, indicate if there is a Canadian site. If there isn't a Canadian site, it doesn't mean that you cannot join a trial, but it does mean that um, it there might be less opportunities for Canadians because they will be often in the States. You can sometimes travel there. Um, and if you are traveling to a trial, they will pay for, for all your expenses. Um, but I think the way you can do it is uh, if you look on clinicaltrials.gov at a specific trial, you can also go to our website, which links out to this information. Um, information for each site is listed. So for the Canadian site, there will be a contact information for that site and you can contact them. Um, but yeah, if you need more questions about a specific trial, um, the health information line can help you up there. If it was for a non-gene specific trial, um, again, I think there is a contact um, information that Dr. Kunukoop has provided, but it's sort of a, a general box that they're just keeping track of people now. Um, and then when the trial opens up, they will be, be contacting patients. Yeah, that's that's great. And I just to add to that, um, we just recently I meant to mention this earlier, got lost in my list of things, but we just actually had a big update of our clinical trials page. So there's a fair number of trials that have been added. And we've also made sure to note, like we've gone through all the trials to make sure to add if there's a Canadian site. So if there's a Canadian site, it should be listed there. Um, and because I know the clinical trials gov .gov page can be a bit hard to navigate. So we've tried to simplify that um, for you know innovative trials in um, mostly in IRDs, AMD, and a bit of uh, diabetes related eye disease as well. So yeah, if you have any questions about that though, Health Info is a great place to come. We can help you navigate that a bit as well. Um, okay, so we have another question from Marie Jose uh, asking, uh, would like to know if you if we know anything about research um, in RP by Dr. Edwin Stone at Iowa University. Um, short answer, because unfortunately I don't know anything about it. I will look it up afterwards and see, but I, I haven't heard about any specific. I, I don't know that researcher. I'm sorry, yeah. but I, I'll definitely look, look it up and, and, and see, see and, what sort of research is happening. Yeah, and again, if you want to send us an email to Health Info, uh, Larissa and I can kind of work together to, to look it up and see if we can find anything for you. Um, so a question from David, is Canada involved in the Luminous XLRP research and or clinical trials? Um, yes, I believe they are. Um, I think there is a Canadian site. I think Toronto might be a Canadian site. I don't think the trial is up and running yet, though, or not that no, the trial is up and running. I don't think the Canadian site is fully up and running yet. Um, the Canada will be will be involved in that. And there might be another site in Canada as well, actually, but um, I, I know I'm pretty sure Toronto is definitely a site. Yeah, I'm pretty sure as well. Yeah. Um, the, we had a question from Helene, and I, she says, can a patient be a member? And I think when we were talking about that, we were talking about the, um, or when that question came in, we were talking about the patient registry. Oh, okay. Um, I think. If, <laughs> that's if, if that's the case, Helene, if, if there is um, a different, if, if, if I'm not answering your question, please, I'm clarifying in the, in the chat or the Q&A. Um, so in terms of joining the patient registry, 
it is for individuals who've got inherited retinal disease and 100% you can definitely join the patient registry. So there's a different, few different ways to do it. You can go onto our website and onto the patient registry link or Morgan will look out in her um, email. And, um, and you can um, get information about, depending on where you are in the country, there are different sites that you can join. If you're in um, Ontario, we have, a, we have a couple of sites in Ontario. We have sites in Halifax, in Montreal, in Alberta, and in BC. If you don't live in one of those provinces or can't travel to, to the clinic, um, there's other ways to join. Um, it's preferable if you have genetic testing done, but it is not required. But a lot of the, um, the patient registry currently is used to identify patients for um, trials for specific genetic mutations. So it's a, um, something you might want to talk to your ophthalmologist about, about getting genetic testing or getting the inform if you have genetic testing, getting that into the registry, but yes. Great. Um, our next question. Uh, this is probably more for me. It says, uh, is there a possibility that there'll be a meeting in person in Ottawa or Montreal eventually? Uh, absolutely. I mean, we would love to come everywhere, <laughs> but we are just uh, coming kind of a slower start back into things after the pandemic. Uh, we were in Ottawa in 2020, right before the pandemic hit, but I, I do hope that uh, in the near future, we'll be able to, to come back out that way um, to, to, to visit and to connect. Um, got a great question here from Pamela. I want I want to know more about this too. So Pamela is asking if you can tell us a little bit more about the new competition that was announced as a partnership with CIA, CIHR to help early stage researchers transition to independent positions. Um, so it's called the CA, CIHR Research Excellent Diversity and Independent Early Career Transition Award. That's a mouthful. <laughs> It is. I think we're call or they're calling it CIHR Ready. So this is a CIHR initiative that Fighting Blind is Canada is partnering on, and the uh, the full initiative is really to support um, individuals who are from diverse backgrounds to um, get independent positions. Because um, if you look at sort of who makes up the sort of researchers, professors in in Canada, they aren't necessarily representative of the population of Canada. There's certain populations, um, women, women of diverse backgrounds, um, black individuals who are very underrepresented. So we're really trying to make sure that we are um, taking advantage of all the brains and smarts out there and that people aren't um, sort of leaving leaving the, the industry because they don't have the support, they don't have the mentorship they need. So this is a very specific targeted award, which I think is, um, is, is, is very important. So Fighting Blindness Canada is partnering with CIHR as well as uh, another not-for-profit from the States called Bright Focus, who also has an interest in retinal diseases. And we are funding one specific award. So there's gonna be a dedicated eye disease award, which is really exciting. And so if there's an individual from a diverse background, from an underrepresented group, um, they can apply for this award. They are individuals have to be usually in sort of late stage, either postdocs or um, sort of clinical fellowships. So before they actually have an independent position, and this is a six year grant. So the competition has just been announced and um, more details are available on either Fighting Blindness Canada's website or CIHR's website. And we'll be announcing the winner of that in 2023. Excellent. Sounds great. It's going to be a very busy year next year. In it is, research, yeah. I think. Yeah. So some re right. really good, good announcements, I think, next year. Yeah. Um, Ivy's asking if you have any news or updates on Stargardt's disease. So I'd say a couple of things. The one thing I want to highlight, this is um, sort of goes back to what Morgan was talking about, about Eye on the Cure. So one of our contestants this year was Dr. Bob Chow, who is trying to understand the role that inflammation plays in Stargardt's disease. And so um, him and his um, team member, Dr. Bridget Ryan, they won the Research um, Watch Award. So that was a $50,000 award. And it's really about trying to understand if um, the role that inflammation plays, but more importantly, if they find a role for inflammation, is there going to be a way to essentially uh, to um, use a drug to um, damp down that inflammatory reaction and prevent um, vision loss progressing? So that's um, sort of something that's on the field. And I think there's other researchers out there looking at, at things like that. I was looking back over our um, latest in vision research section from our e-news, and there was a clinical trial that was launched in 2022, which is testing if a drug called um, 
tinlirabent. So I have to look to see to see the name of it if it can slow disease progression in Stargardt's disease. So um, again, it's really interesting starting to look at some of these sort of drug-based therapies as opposed to only genetic-based therapies. And so this is actually a phase three trial. And so it's looking at uh, comparing taking the drug versus a placebo and to see if it um, reduces sort of a toxic accumulation of products that accumulates in Stargardt's disease. And it plans to complete the trial in 2024. So we'll of course keep you updated about that. And um, yeah, and, and you know, there's sort of a bunch of other studies. If there's anything else um, that's sort of ongoing, you can find information on our clinical trials page on our website. But we, we've listed some some other trials for Stargardt disease. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, Dr. Bob Chow has been on Viewpoint a few times before talking about different facets of his research in Stargardt. And most recently, he joined us in Vancouver. So uh, one of our more recent recordings that we shared was a panel about IRD research, um, and he was on that panel. So uh, that's a great one to check out if you haven't seen that one. Um, so our last question. Oh, no, I had a couple of questions. I forgot I have an email. Uh, I had an email from Bobby, and Bobby asked, uh, what percentage of people get selected from my retina tracker to be candidates for clinical trials? Um, so I don't know the exact answer to that question. So my retina tracker is a patient registry, but that is run by Foundation Fighting Blindness in the U.S., although Canadian patients can join it as well. So I can't speak to what percentage of patients from my retina tracker get contacted for clinical trials. Um, and I can't, for the um, fighting blindness Canada patient registry. I can't give you an exact number, but as I mentioned, um, from one site in 2022, 13 patients were contacted um, to participate in different clinical trials. The patient registry currently has just over 2,000 patients, and we're sort of growing by leaps and bounds every every day. I know I'm looking at some trials that will be starting in Toronto, but both natural history as well as um, phase one, phase two, or phase three clinical trials in the next few years, there could be up to 100 um, to even 150 different um, sort of participants needed for different trials. So the number is still small overall, but really growing sort of almost exponentially as more and more treatments are entering clinical trial stage. I don't, I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, but just for context, like that, even 13 to me seems like a big number based on the past few years. Like it's really starting to grow. I mean, from almost nothing in Canada specifically to, to more and more. Absolutely. Because um, these are just patients who would be recruited to, to trials that are taking place in Canada. And there will be even more where patients are traveling to usually right. the States um, for treatment. So yeah, compared to when I even started this organization three years ago, to now like the idea that each of one site had 13 patients this yeah. year entering clinical trials to me is actually a bit mind-blowing. It's really, really exciting. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, we have a, another question here from Rona. Uh, Rona's asking, what are the chances of developing ser uh, serous retinal epithelial detachment in my second eye? So I will just preface by saying neither of us are medical doctors. That's a real an ophthalmologist question. Um, we did just a few weeks ago, have a viewpoint about retinal detachment. So I definitely encourage you to go back and check that out because there is some conversation there about um, that. I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that one, Larissa. No, I'm sorry. I don't even want to speculate on that <laughs> because I, I don't really know enough about the disease and about your sort of personal medical history to be able to make um, any sort of answer to that. But um, yeah, I would suggest checking out that viewpoint, which they did talk about retinal detachment as well. And, and just chatting with your eye doctor as well, like talking yeah. about, um, you know, what what your he, that that person will know more about your condition and be able to give you a better a better answer. Um, okay, I think we might be just sort of on time here. I think we've answered all our questions. Um, thank you, Larissa. Thank you so much for joining me and having a chat. Um, it's been really great. I love doing this program with you. It's been a, a great year. I agree. Um, I would say yeah, a happy end of year to everybody, happy holidays, happy new year, and um, I'm looking forward to, to seeing everybody in, in 2023. It was almost said 2024, 2023. Oh my gosh, don't jump ahead. <laughs> So as we close out, I just want to thank each and every one of you for taking part in our programs this year. You know, Jamie talked about some really wonderful ways that you can support Fighting Blindness Canada through donation if you're able. 
uh, we of course appreciate every dollar that we receive and it really enables us to fund this amazing research that we've talked about today. Um, but I also just want to extend a special thank you to all the different ways that you are um, supporting us, whether it be through attending our Viewpoint webinars, to coming out to our in-person events, volunteering at our in-person events and helping uh, us run them very smoothly, um, you know, being a mentor, taking the time to fill out our surveys. These are all incredible ways that you help support our community and we're just really grateful for that. So thank you.